now that we're better. Thank you so much, all everyone, for being here. My name is Carol Lobos, and I work at the Tulare Public Library. We're so glad that you're here with us today. I want to introduce Doris Liu. She is the Community Outreach Coordinator for the National Kidney Foundation, and I'm so excited to have this program today. Hi, yes. Um, so thank you so much. We are very happy anytime somebody invites us to talk about kidneys because we love talking about kidneys and why it matters um, to everyone so much more than you might think. So today we have um, two patients who will share their kidney story. They live in the Central Valley area. So Maria and Jennifer are here with us today. Um, but before that, um, we just want to tell you a little bit about kidneys and what they do because the average person doesn't know the difference between kidneys and the liver and how they're different or they know that they're shaped like jelly beans. But beyond that, where are they? What do they do? Um, not a whole lot that people know. So we're going to start off with just a uh, a simple uh, presentation about kidneys. Uh, so your kidneys and you. Hello everyone, I'm Brianna. Thank you for including the National Kidney Foundation and for making kidney health a priority. The National Kidney Foundation is a nonprofit health organization focusing on the whole person through the lens of kidney disease. We are fueled by determination and urgency, and NKF is a lifeline for all people affected by kidney disease. So before we get started, we'd just like to see where everyone is at in terms of their knowledge of kidneys and kidney disease. So feel free to just raise your hand or throw up an emoji if any of these apply to you. So do you know what your kidneys do? Do you know anyone with kidney disease? Do you know anyone on dialysis? Do you know anyone who has received a transplant or donated a kidney? To begin, I wanna share a few facts about kidney disease. One in three adults is at risk for developing chronic kidney disease and that's roughly 33%. One in seven American adults has kidney disease and most don't know it. Think about your family, your neighborhood, or your community. Kidney disease is likely already impacting people in your life and they may or may not realize it. That's why I'm sharing this message with you today. Kidney disease is the ninth leading cause of death in the United States and it's a serious problem. It's more fatal than breast cancer or prostate cancer, diseases that are more well known. The good news is that early detection and treatment can slow down or stop the progression of kidney disease and unlike cancer or other illnesses that can be difficult to treat with kidney disease, we know that healthy lifestyle changes can make a big difference. But we need greater awareness of the problem. COVID-19 impacts kidneys too. Sorry about that. People with kidney disease are at greater risk for developing severe complications if they contract COVID-19. So most of us have two kidneys and each kidney is the size of a fist. Each kidney weighs about five ounces and they're located near the middle of your back, just below the rib cage. Kidneys do many things in addition to making urine to remove waste from our body. They balance minerals and the pH or acidity of the blood. They balance the body's fluids, removing excess fluid when your body has more than it needs and they hold onto fluid when you aren't taking enough in. The kidneys also keep our bones healthy by activating vitamin D and this helps our bones repair and rebuild. They also produce hormones that help with blood pressure and make red blood cells that carry oxygen throughout the body. How do your kidneys work? A healthy kidney filters toxins and waste from our bloodstream. We can compare the function of our kidneys to that of a coffee filter. When you make coffee, the filter keeps the coffee grains inside but allows water to pass through. Your kidneys do something similar. They keep the things you need inside your body but filter out things you don't need. The coffee in your coffee pot is like the clean blood sent back into your body and the grounds are the waste products that are sent to your bladder in the form of urine. First, blood enters the kidneys through an artery from the heart. Blood is cleaned by passing through the millions of tiny blood filters called nephrons, which remove waste products and extra fluid from the blood. The waste becomes urine, which flows down the ureters and into the bladder. When the bladder is full, urine is passed down the body through the urethra and then newly clean blood goes back into a vein and back into circulation. 
So what does it mean when you have chronic kidney disease or CKD? CKD is a term or conditions that damage your kidneys and decrease their ability to filter blood the way they should. Over time, our kidneys become less able to filter our blood and waste builds up. Kidney disease can cause high blood pressure and heart disease. More people with kidney disease die from heart disease than from kidney failure. Kidney disease can cause bone disease and decrease our red blood cells causing anemia. These problems may happen slowly over a long period of time, and there can be a good amount of damage to your kidneys without any outward signs. Because of this, many people don't find out they have kidney disease until their kidneys have failed. If untreated, kidney disease can lead to kidney failure, and at that point, treatments like dialysis or kidney transplant are needed. Dialysis is exhausting and time-consuming. It means three or four treatments a week for three or four hours each time. So who's at risk and what do we do about it? Diabetes and high blood pressure are the two leading causes of kidney disease. They cause three out of four cases of kidney failure in the US. Diabetes is the leading cause of kidney disease. Nearly half of all cases of kidney failure are caused by diabetes. Diabetes occurs when your body does not make enough insulin or cannot use normal amounts of insulin properly. Diabetes injures small blood vessels in the body, and when this happens, your kidneys cannot clean your blood properly. High blood pressure is the second leading cause. Blood pressure is the force of blood pushing against the walls of your blood vessels as your heart pumps blood around your body. Most people with high blood pressure do not have any symptoms, and for this reason, it is often called a silent killer. The only way to find out if you have high blood pressure is to have it measured. Like diabetes, there are things you can do to manage your high blood pressure, which will protect your kidneys. For example, eat healthy meals, get regular exercise, and limit how much salt you eat. Keeping your blood pressure under control is the best way to reduce your chance that it will lead to kidney disease or other health problems, including heart attacks or strokes. While these numbers may be shocking to you or make you feel worried about your own health, they're meant to encourage you to make changes now. Just having these conditions does not mean you will get kidney disease. Certain populations are at greater risk for developing kidney failure. African Americans are three times more likely to develop, to develop kidney failure. Hispanics and Latinos are more than one and a half times more likely. And Native Americans, Asian Americans, and Pacific Islanders are also at higher risk. Non-white racial and ethnic groups often face higher rates of many diseases, and there are many contributing factors to this, including higher rates of diabetes, high blood pressure, and obesity in these populations, different access to health insurance or health care, and other social determinants of health, like where you live, access to healthy foods, and safe places to exercise. Some of these factors are outside of an individual individual's ability to change and may require community and society level change, but individuals can take steps to reduce their risk too by making healthy lifestyle choices. 33% of American adults are at risk for kidney disease, but most of them don't know it. But it only takes a minute and a few simple questions to find out if you are in the 33%. We've already talked about diabetes, high blood pressure, and heart disease. There are other factors. Are you over 60? Do you have a family member who has kidney disease? If you are overweight, it increases your risk of developing diabetes and high blood pressure, which can damage your kidneys. And if you are smoking or vaping, quit. If you answered yes to any of these, you are in the 33% of Americans at risk for kidney disease. But hold on, don't panic. Just because you have risk factors doesn't mean you have kidney disease. It just means you should find out. If you have risk factors, especially diabetes or high blood pressure, you need to get tested for kidney disease. Most adults with CKD do not know they have it. One in two people with very low kidney function but not yet on dialysis do not know they have CKD. About one third of people currently on dialysis did not see a kidney doctor before starting dialysis. And many of these people did not even know they had kidney kidney disease until their kidneys had failed. Considering the amount we know about how to best slow down kidney disease progression and that simple things like diet change, physical activity, and the right medications can prevent kidney failure, this is devastating. There are two simple tests for kidney disease, and they're inexpensive and easy, a urine test and a blood test. 
So in summary, this is what you should do if you have any risk factors for kidney disease. Get tested, control your risks, adjust your diet, exercise, quit smoking, and be careful when taking pain medicine. To find out if you are at risk and see if you qualify for a free home urine test, go to minuteforyourkidneys.org, take the one minute online quiz and get your personalized results. We also have recommended questions for your doctor and other resources available for you. Take the kidney quiz, just one minute might save your life. And now I will be passing it over to Doris. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Brianna. That was really a lot of really good information. Um, I hope everybody watching before the end of the day, you go take that quiz, minuteforyourkidneys.org um, or .com. They both work. Um, and honestly, it only took me 30 seconds. So it's very easy, very quick, and very important. So now I want to introduce to you Maria and Jennifer, who both live in the Central Valley area, and they have come to share their kidney stories. So um, Maria, I am going to start with you. You're in that corner of my screen. Um, I like your orange in the background there. So Maria, can you tell us um, where you're from, what city, and one or two interesting facts about yourself? Hello, my name is Maria Grijalva. Yes, I am a lifelong resident of Tulare, California. And two interesting facts is I do not stop advocating for kidney health. And my other interesting fact is that I love to spend time with my two granddaughters as much as possible. Oh, how old are they? Well, one is 20 and one is is uh, 16. Oh, good, good. Those are <laughs> great ages. All ages are good, but I love those ages. Um, good. And Jennifer, um, let's hear from you. Where, what city are you from? And uh, one or two interesting facts about yourself. Hi, I'm Jennifer McClellan. I come from the small town of Springville. Uh, two interesting facts about me is I'm adopted and I love the game of footy from Australia. So what was that name of the game? The game name is Footy from Australia. Oh, Footy. Okay, I'm going to have to look that up. No, thank you so much. Um, okay, so let's hear a little bit um, about your journey. So both of you are kidney patients. You both went through kidney failure and have since gotten a transplant. So let's just start with um, what's it like to have kidney disease? Um, what's it like? How do you feel it in your body? How did it affect your life at home, at work, your diet, any of that? Give us a glimpse. Um, Maria, let's start with you. Well, I worked for the high school district and I thought it was my students giving me a headache. Uh, did not realize it was high blood pressure, uh, which I did not know. And um, again, that's when I found out that my kidneys were, were being affected uh, way more than what I thought, uh, in fact, going into failure. Um, the other thing is that I was feeling sick, didn't want to eat anything. I thought maybe I might have been turning into a vegetarian because I was avoiding meat. Uh, food kind of repulsed me. Um, I had like a, like a flu-like symptom that didn't go away. And that's basically how, how I was feeling. I was not feeling that great. So um, you, you mentioned that you didn't, you didn't feel like eating much. So it affected not only what you could eat, but even your, your even desire to eat, like nothing seemed appetizing. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and your energy level, you were tired. Yeah. Tired. So, yeah. When were you actually diagnosed? I mean, how did you find out that it was the kidneys and not something? Well, like after that? a lot of different testings, the doctors could not figure out what I had. So I kept going and going and going. Um, I'm not a hypochondriac. I knew that I was sick. They just couldn't figure out what I had. And uh, that's the problem with kidney disease. It's difficult to diagnose. Mm -hmm. I'm not diabetic. I did have high blood pressure. So by the time they did diagnose me after so many tests, um, I was in end stage renal failure. Mm -hmm. wow. And that was in about a year before I needed to be on dialysis. Wow. Yeah. So you did go through, how long were you on dialysis? I was on dialysis for exactly 100 sessions oh. at four hours each session 
for three days out of the week. Wow. Wow. Yeah. I, I hear that that in itself is kind of an exhausting uh, experience, but of course, very important because it's life sustaining. Um, great. Thank you. Um, Jennifer, so your story is a little bit different. Um, tell us how were you diagnosed? Um, how did you experience it in your body? How did it affect your life uh, with work at home? Any of that? Can you share with us what life was like with kidney with uh, CKD? Sure. I was a teenager. I was 16 and a half and about two months before I was diagnosed, I had gained a lot of weight and I was sick off and on with the flu. My parents kept taking me to the doctor until finally the last time the doctor said, you know what, um, let's go ahead and do a chest x-ray. I'm afraid that she has pneumonia. So he does the chest x-ray and he finds out my heart is enlarged. Hmm. Immediately from there, he sends me to the cardiologist and the cardiologist decides to draw blood and finds out my creatinine is at 17 which normal for a normal person is one. Mm. That night, he sent me home with a water pill known as Lasix. That night, I was up all night peeing, hoping that we could get that creatine down. My mom takes me to the hospital the next day and they tell me, your creatine is still at 17 and you need to start dialysis now. I'm thinking, what is this, you know? I barely knew what my kidneys did, let alone what dialysis was. Yeah. So, yeah. Once getting started, it, it was a whole new world for me. At 16 and a half, I should have been picking out prom dresses. And here I was picking out which style of dialysis I should do. Yeah. I could no longer eat the foods I wanted, I was limited on how much liquid I could have a day. And the type of dialysis that I chose, peritoneal, I was lucky my family was very supportive and my dad learned how to hook me up to the machine. But unfortunately I was on this machine for 11 hours at night. Hmm. Wow, that's a long time, 11 hours, yeah. So that's 11 hours every night that you're doing that. Yeah. Correct. Yeah, so you're sleeping eight hours a night, but you're still tethered to that machine even after you're uh, you're up or even before you go to bed. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. It took me time to a new extent. Yeah. So that's a lot to go through at 16. I mean, you you're right, you missed all like those really cr uh, crucial years of high school and your childhood. So um and it's interesting. I hear this a lot where it's, you know, other parts of the body affect the kidneys. I mean, of course, the whole body is kind of all related, but the heart and kidneys have a have a, a specially important connection, but you had an enlarged heart. Um and so I'm sure that was uh, caused a lot of problems in addition to the kidneys. Um yeah. So, um Tell us about peritoneal dialysis. That's something that not a lot of people know about. Most of the time we think of dialysis as going to a center, you're hooked up to a machine, blood through this tube leaves your body, the machine cleans it and goes back. That's called hemodialysis. But for you, peritoneal is something that um, you did at home um, and with the support of your family. Can you talk a little bit about um, the support through your family? Um, you talked about your dad learning how to do the machine um, and you didn't have a lot of energy. They thought that you had um, pneumonia. How else did um, your family support you in that process? My family was very supportive in the way they didn't treat me like I was quote unquote sick. They allowed me to call when I was like, you know what, I'm not feeling too good, you know, so let's just say we took a trip to Disneyland. They would look to me and I go, yeah, I am gonna need a break. So they let me sit. They were very good when it came to my diet that they made the food so that it didn't have a lot of salt and they could always add extra salt when it came to that later. You know, they, they made sure to learn the diet too. So I didn't feel alone during that time. Hmm. That's wonderful. Yeah, we always hear, you know, uh, the role of the family uh, and friends and your caregivers is very, very important. Um, let's move on to the transplant story. Uh, story. So um, tell us 
Maria, what was it like <laughs> to get your transplant? Who did you get your transplant from? Um, and that process, how did that happen? Well, the transplant, uh, that was kind of, in those days, this was 30 plus years back, there was no such thing as talking about kidney disease or transplant. Uh, but the my doctor, my nephrologist had mentioned the best uh, for you would be to get someone from your family to donate an organ. And um, talking in my mother and father's living room was my brother. And I just started talking, you know, my doctor told me the best chances for me to get off of dialysis was to get a, uh, an organ from a family member. And so just like that, my brother said, I'll do it. And he said it so fast that I needed to repeat it again because I thought he didn't actually hear me. Mm -hmm. uh, that's how fast he responded to, to donate a kidney. And I said, well, this is what it entails. And I explained to him. So anyway, uh, fast forward, we've done our dialysis, uh, excuse me, our transplant in Los Angeles at St. Vincent's Medical Center. We did have to drive at least, you know, three hours, you know, that's what we have to do. We transplant is not done locally. We have to drive to the areas where they do the specialized surgeries. And um, we did it and I even gave him an out as we were side by side on our gurneys. Hey, if you need to change your mind, um, now's the time. Uh, you have my permission to skip out if you said, you know what, I don't want to do this, but I almost did it. <laughs> where we're going. Oh, hello. <laughs> we're, we're going, we're going on with this. And uh, nowadays the surgeries are done laparoscopically. Uh, the, it's not, com it's nothing compared to what my brother had gone to. But again, here we are, uh, we are joining uh, our uh, celebrations every year and educating others. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm smiling because just as we're entering this part of the, the uh, interview, John pops on. And John, I have not met you in person, but I'm very excited that you're here. I he have heard a lot about you. And so we need to move on to Jennifer. But John, do you want to chime in with like just a little bit? John is Maria's brother and her living donor. So she's talking about you. Anything you want to add to her story? Well, just the fact that you know, if it had been the other way around, I know my sister would have done it for me. And so, you know, um, but I'll tell you what, though, it was quite an experience and one I'll never forget. And that's for sure. So, um, yeah. So, but, you know, God bless all the donors and the recipients. And hopefully we can um, get the word out and more people will be willing to donate and help out. Wonderful. Thank you so much. So glad you're here. If we have time later, we'd love to hear more um, from you. But let's sure. move on to Jennifer. So Jennifer, um, you have a, a different story. Your donor came from a different place. Tell us about your transplant process. Yes, well, since I am adopted, none of my family members matched me for a kidney. So I had to be placed on the transplant list, which meant that after being tested, I needed to find a match with, from a cadaver kidney of someone who had passed away and said yes. So I was placed on the list and on December 3rd of 2015, I get a call at six in the morning. They found a match. Unfortunately, a young teenager had passed away and his family had said yes to donate his organs. My mom and me, we grab our bags that were pre-packed, ready to go, put them in the car and head out to UCSF, which is about a five hour drive. That day we went through rain, wind, fog, you name it, we did it. Get to the hospital, I'm immediately admitted. They drew some blood, did an echo and last minute checks on my heart. All was good. They said, it's a match, you're good to go. I was taken down to the ORR and next thing I know, I wake up, my first word is, ouchie, <laughs> but I received a new kidney. <laughs> ouchie seems like a little word for a really major surgery. <laughs> so um, so how long- what I felt. <laughs> <laughs> 
How long was the recovery? How long were you in the hospital? I was actually in the hospital only four days. Okay. Okay. But I had to go back to UCSF weekly, biweekly, and so yeah. on from there yeah. for about a year. Yeah. Um, I always wonder what it's like to get the call, you know, and to have your bags ready. I mean, it's a little bit like, I mean, not so much the call, but like when you're about to, when a, a pregnant woman's about to give birth and you have that bag, you never know when it's time, you got to be ready. And when it's time, you go. Um, and for you, it was many hours getting to the transplant clinic. Um, and that's wonderful that you got there and it was a match and everything worked out. Um, yeah, wonderful. Um, so let's see, I want to ask you more about, um, uh, so for both of you, describe, if you were just to describe life before and after getting a kidney, um, uh, Maria, what would you say in just a few words? What is life, summarize, life before transplant? Life before transplant, I was sick, nauseated, no energy. Uh, after transplant, I'm energetic, <laughs> nonstop, um, and uh, healthy, thank God. Um, I'm able to do so much with my family and life, with life, enjoying life. Yeah. I passed through my energy. <laughs> <laughs> Very uh, true. <laughs> I've only known Maria with lots of energy. So if that is true, John, you must have a ton of energy. <laughs> so so the way I have pictured in my mind, you both um, are amazing advocates, lots of energy, and we're very thankful for you both. Yeah. Um, so what about you, Jennifer? Life before transplant and after? Me, life before, I was restricted. I felt tied down, especially being a to a machine for 11 hours at night, but there was always this hopefulness for something better. Afterwards, I'm grateful that a family out there who lo just lost their son said yes to donation. As Minute Rhea said, there's energy. In fact, after my transplant, I was able to go to Yosemite and walk around. That was huge. And I felt a nude. Hmm. Um, thank you. Thank you. Yes, that's I hear that a lot. Um, what's really amazing is, you know, I was talking to a kidney doctor this morning. Um, and so you, Maria, you got your uh, kidney from John, a living donor, and then Jennifer from a deceased donor. Um, a living donor kidney, on average, um, lasts for 16 to 20 years. So you blew way past that, Maria. How long have you had John's kidney? Um, I've had John's kidney, we just celebrated this April 15th, 34 years, and I'm not going to let it go. <laughs> <laughs> 34, John, that's some kidney. That's amazing. And Jennifer, um, how long, tell us again, uh, how long has your kidney lasted? Uh, it's been five years so far. Five years. Okay, Five that's years. wonderful. And and uh, doing good. So that's great to hear. Well, the, since we have, yes, John. The the, the reason it she it lasted so long is I'm I'm left-handed and and they took my left kidney, which really, boy, I'm telling you, they. Uh, I think that's why it's lasted so long. <laughs> <laughs> Well, John, since we have you uh, on the Zoom call, can you tell us life before and after giving a kidney? Well, before, I mean, you know, you're I, you're normal. You know, you're you're you go about your you, you take things for granted. And uh, after, oh my God, it was a long recovery. Um, you know, my my dad had to help me get dressed and. I couldn't bend over. Uh, um, it, it, life was really hard. It was hard, and uh, but so but the progress is measured in weekly increments. Every week, uh, I felt better, and uh, you know, so um, yeah. It, I'm telling you, it was it was quite a it was well, quite an experience, you know. And uh, anyway, that over. 
<laughs> and uh, but it was quite an experience. Uh, um, it took at least six months uh, for me just to be able to go back to work. Uh, and that, was, that was then. That was yeah. then. You had a big uh, surgery, no. not like we are now. No, I, it, was, it was. It was. It was. It was huge, but uh, but I'll tell you what, uh, uh, it, you know, you know, I had a, now I, I try to watch what I eat. I try to t really take care of my kidney because I only have one. And then with this pandemic, I have to be extremely careful, extremely careful. I, I do not want to lose my remaining kidney for anything. Yes. So. No, no, absolutely not. Um, can I ask you? I imagine a lot of people wonder how has giving up one kidney affected your kidney function? Um, my, uh, not at all. I, I, my, what happens, here's what happens. It's, it's the miracle of, uh, of uh, biology and I think in God's design. And that is that you're, you know, a month after uh, you donate, you come down with high blood pressure and the high blood pressure actually uh, it's like inflating a balloon. It actually makes your remaining kidney enlarge and to help uh, for the capacity to enlarge the capa the blood capacity flow to compensate for uh, the missing one. And then after a month, the high blood pressure goes away, you're back to normal and the body sort of like readjusts itself. Mm -hmm. And so it's kind of a mother nature's way of compensating for the one that's missing. And uh, but I'm fine. Everything, you know, I'm, I, you know, I'm eating too much because of the pandemic but at home, but because I work from home and uh, but no, it's everything's fine. It's just no it's, heart, blood pressure. It was no high blood pressure. I'm, I'm not on any medication. So I'm, I'm very fortunate. I turned 64 this August 3rd. So I think that's pretty good for somebody my age. I say that's very good. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to go to the chat and see if there are any questions. Um, let's see. How long were you on dialysis, Jennifer? Oh, 17 years. You already answered that. 17 years. That's a long time to be on dialysis. So and, and part of I, I know you were on peritoneal, but part of that was on hemo. Was it correct? So I did 14 years, 14 and a half years on peritoneal until I had some major complications and wasn't able to do peritoneal anymore. So they switched me over to hemo. And that's when I decided it was time to go for a kidney. Before that, I said, you know what? I'm doing okay here. There's a lot of people who aren't. I'm gonna go ahead and let that kidney go to someone else. Mm. Wow, wow, that's very um, altruistic of you, yeah. And that kidney wait list is very, very long. You know, I it's in the Bay Area, it's a good, eight, nine years long, um, partly depending on your blood type, but um, yeah. Um, Jennifer, do you know the donor family? Have you been in contact with them? No, unfortunately, I have not been in yeah. contact, but I hope to one day. Yeah, yeah. I, I know sometimes um, people make that connection, and, and I actually know of a, a woman who received a kidney from, um, unfortunately, someone who, who died in an accident, and the donor family has a reunion every year with um, the person that received the kidney, the person that received the heart, the person. So it's just a, kind of a beautiful, you know, beautiful picture out of something that uh, was born out of tragedy. Yeah. So um, any other questions that people have, especially for, you know, Maria, Jennifer and John, since we have John here. John, can I <laughs> add, Yeah. Can I ask you what are the um, some of the most common questions you get asked about, like, you know, do people ask, like, why would you give a donor uh, a kidney? <laughs> Anything like that? Well, it's your sister, of course, but concerns that people had or questions? Uh, mostly like, um, what are you going to feel like afterwards? You know, uh, will you be able, to, will you be limited uh, in your physical abilities and things like this? And I tell them, no, uh, you know, of course, like any major surgery, you have your recovery period. But, um, you know, I, I reassure them that, you know, hey, guess what? It's, you're going to be just fine after you recover. Uh, you do have to watch, you know, your diet a little bit better. You have to educate yourself. I know I did, and I had to educate myself. I, I know my, my nephrologist, Dr. Chen, uh, put me on a vegetarian diet for three years. And I'll tell you what, that was probably the best thing for me 
Uh, I should go back, actually. I wouldn't be as fat as I am now if I was a vegetarian diet. But uh, but no, they, uh, I, I, you know, I reassure them that, that you know, if you donate, you're going to be just fine. It's, you know, it's, of course, it's like any surgery, you have your recovery process, but everything will turn out just fine. It, it won't affect you one, in the least. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, well, some of you know I'm actually a kidney recipient, but my living donor, two days out of the hospital had jumped up on this banister and i just i thought how is he able to do that but that was something he did and and uh, he actually walked back to the hotel um and and just did a whole lot of walking like two days after um his after getting out of hospital and he was there for just three days so wow yeah I'll i'll tell you what i'll beat that one i had it done the old way and three days later I walked over to see my sister. <laughs> oh my goodness! How far? Uh, it was, she was. She was far pretty far. far. <laughs> she was. I was exhausted by the time I went to go see her, but I, that wasn't supposed to happen back in the day. She was supposed to come see me. <laughs> And I felt so bad when I see him right there at the foot of my bed. I'm like, oh my gosh. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> That well, was a feat. <laughs> yeah, it's it's wonderful to see you're both doing well and um, you know giving a kidney and getting a kidney uh, going through that surgery. You're both thriving, and that's wonderful to see. Um, so let's let's end with um, I have a question, a closing question for each of you. Um, Jennifer, I'm going to start with you first. So Jennifer, what would you say to somebody um, on the call who might be newly diagnosed with? chronic kidney disease. They might be starting dialysis for the first time and um, just feeling overwhelmed. What, what words do you want to share with them? Yeah, after doing 17 years of dialysis, I can tell you to follow the diet, go to your treatments, ask questions. There are no stupid questions. You're going to have to advocate for yourself if you want something, find out about it, go for it. But my final advice, I would say most importantly, staying positive. Just because it's called dialysis doesn't mean you're dying. That enjoy the little things in life, whether it be jumping in the puddles, seeing a rainbow, enjoy those. And keep that sense of humor because those are the things that are going to get you through those tough times. Hmm. That is beautiful. That is beautiful. Um, Carmen, you have your hand up. You have a question or something? Comment? Yes, I do. Thank you. Um, so I'm just wondering, Maria and Jennifer, if you guys ha- would have taken that quiz, that one minute quiz back when you were first diagnosed, um, would you have would you have been aware that there was a problem? I'm sure. I'm very sure. Because like they say, it's the silent killer. You don't feel anything while it's going on. Meanwhile, I mean, you can't even start to figure out when it started. By the time you feel what you feel, you're you're in grave uh, circumstances. And like me, me, I was like the 133% not knowing uh, and they couldn't find the reason why I was sick, test, test, because it mimics so much. It mimics cancer, it mimics other things, and do they give you a pill for this and that? And uh, and we, I went back, they retested me, and that's what they found. And even after all of those tests, I went and got a second opinion in Santa Barbara because, again, I wasn't ready to be on dialysis or needing a transplant but that's what I needed. And uh, so this is why I advocate uh, if you have diabetes or high blood pressure, please check yourself because you can hit it off knowing and learning what to do. For me, it was too late. It, it was already gone. Great. So Lynn, I remember that one minute quiz that wasn't available back in the day. That's recent. Nothing. Yeah. We, we didn't have any of that back in the day. Yeah. Um, Jennifer, did you want to add anything to that? Me, I honestly can't say it would have said I was at risk 
because I was 16. I was adopted, so I did not know if there was diabetes in my background. Um, at the time, I don't think I had high blood pressure. You know, as I said, I felt sick. But this is also why it's known, kidney failure is known as a silent killer. It can go unnoticed. And it's so important for us when we see our doctor saying, you know what, can you add in a renal check into that blood work or to have a urine test if you don't like being poked so that you can catch it early and possibly keep it from overtaking and ending up on dialysis. Yes, no, thank you very much. And and I, I just wanna add, because I'm so passionate about letting people know it is so important because I did have high blood pressure when I was 40 and um, my doctor knew he wanted to see me every three months for my high blood pressure, but never was the idea of kidney health brought up. And um, so if I had been diagnosed earlier, I think, I think that would have definitely made a difference. I did go on to have dialysis um, and a transplant and I'm doing great now. Um, but yeah, there was a point when I was first diagnosed and I, wanted, I learned everything I could about kidney health, how to keep it healthy, how to um, um, possibly prevent the progression of kidney disease. And I brought all that information to my doctor and he said, yes, but for you, it's too late. And unfortunately, that's a really common story. People are just getting diagnosed too late. Um, just like Maria and Jennifer are saying, it's a silent killer. You just don't feel it. You feel fine. And by the time you feel anything, it's usually too late. Um, so thanks. And then Maria, I was actually going to ask you just that. You know, What would you say to someone who's watching who uh, have no clue that they may or may not be at risk? But I think you just answered that. It's just so, so important. It's a silent disease. and. Uh, you, you just don't know. Um, so, and John, since we have you here, can you, uh, what would you say to somebody who might be thinking of donating a kidney? Well, number one, uh, again, uh, follow your doctor's, um, you know, advice, uh, whatever they tell you to do, you know, you've got to do it. Uh, you know, hopefully you, you're living a clean life where, you know, you don't pass anything, you know, to your, uh, the recipient. And, uh, um, and you know what, hey, um, don't be afraid, uh, go for it. It's, you know, you're saving somebody's life, you're, you're making a, such a difference in their life. And, um, but I, yeah, that's what I would say is, you know, you know, get, get that medical advice, follow, and then follow it, you know, um, and then prepare yourself. I think, um, um, you know, Jennifer said it best. I mean, you, you got to prepare yourself mentally to go through this. I was, I was in great physical shape, but I'm telling you right now, it's the mental part that you've got to really get. Cause I mean, I'm telling you, I was not ready mentally for the recovery. It, it was tough. It was tough. Great. Well, thank you so much. Yeah. I have heard from um, living donors uh, that it's, it's one of the, the most amazing thing that they have gone through, a most amazing experience. Um, yeah, some of the, you know, it is a whole mental experience as well. Um, and But what I like is that the transplant clinics, um, they are all very protective of living donors. If you think about, uh, are thinking about um, giving a kidney, they watch your health very closely. They It's a very rigorous vetting process. They only let the most healthy through. Um, and they make sure that you are ready physically and mentally. So thank you. Um, there was a couple of uh, applause emojis that went up for you, John. <laughs> so oh, um, thank you. yeah, thank you, so I would put up a cl uh, applause emoji for all you guys. So thank you, Maria. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, I hope I didn't miss any other questions. Um, um, great. So minuteforyourkidneys.org, uh, go take that test. Um, kidney org is the National Kidney Foundation website. Lots of great information there. So thank you so much. Um, Carol, I'm going to throw it back to you. Thank you, Doris. And thank you, everyone. That was amazing, wonderful information. And I, I just want to thank everyone who attended. Uh, we're going to end the YouTube live in a moment. I just want to remind everybody out there, the library is open for business, but we will um, we, we aren't having in-person programming just yet. So we will continue to add programming to our YouTube channel. Um, 
And uh, I just want to encourage everyone, if you can help us to subscribe to our YouTube channel, uh, we need to get to 100 subscribers before we can sort of change our uh, URL to make it really simple. Right now, it's this horrible string of letters. So if, uh, if you can do that for us, it would mean a lot. We're so close. <laughs> but um, this was a great program. Thank you so, so much. Thank you for having us, Carol. 